Hello YouTube, in this video we're going to talk about art, the interpretation of art. So when we engage with artworks it's often important to figure out what the meaning or the point of the artwork is. Uh, one reason for this is that whether an artwork is successful will depend on what the point of it is. Right? What is the artwork trying to do? Once we know what the artwork is trying to do, we can assess how well it does it. Or we might be interested in trying to resolve some sort of ambiguity. So, what is happening at the end of 2001 A Space Odyssey? Um, or, you know, what, what does some part of the artwork represent? Uh, Hans Holbein the Younger's Ambassadors contains a prominent skull in anamorphic perspective down at the bottom of the painting there. Um, if you view it from an extreme oblique angle, then you can see the skull emerge. Viewed face on, it just looks like a kind of, you know, abstract thing just stuck there in the painting. Now, initially, this looks very out of place. You know, what on earth is this doing there? What, do, what does it mean? Um, and, you know, so this is something we want to know. What's the point of this? What does this mean? And of course, we can ask the same for the, the rest of the artwork as well. You know, what does the globe mean? What does the astrolabe mean? What does, right, the, there's a reason why the, an artwork displays and depicts the things that it does. Um, when we engage with art, these are among the questions we ask. These sorts of questions are going to be familiar to anybody with even a passing interest in the arts. But the question is, for us, what is it that determines the meaning of an artwork? So a central debate in philosophy of art concerns whether the intentions of the artist are relevant to an artwork's meaning. Let's begin by stating three broad approaches. So first, there is strong intentionalism. According to strong intentionalism, the artist's intent determines the meaning. So the artwork means whatever the artist intends it to mean, and that's all. That's all there is to it. Uh, next, moderate intentionalism says that the artist's intent is relevant to the meaning. Now, the usual way of elaborating this is to say that of the various possible meanings that an artwork might have when we consider the artwork in itself and in light of artistic conventions, the artist's intent fixes which of those meanings is correct. So, you know, the meaning of an artwork is going to be a combination, basically, of, you know, what we what we see in the artwork, in, the artwork itself, what, you know, what we know from certain artistic and social conventions, and uh, from the intent of the artist. So the intent of the artist is playing a significant role. Finally, there is anti-intentionalism. Uh, the anti-intentionalist says that the artist's intent is irrelevant to the meaning of an artwork. For the anti-intentionalist, the fact that an artwork that an artist intended an artwork to mean that P provides no support whatsoever for the claim that the artwork does indeed mean that P. To learn the meaning of an artwork, we have to look just at the properties of the artwork, plus our background knowledge of the artistic and social conventions of the time. Um, but the artist's intent has, has no role. Um, now, of course, an initial question here is, well, like, what exactly do we mean by artist's intent? I'm going to understand this in a broad sense to mean something like the artist's plan for the work uh, or what the artist wants the work to communicate. The artist will have a desire to produce a particular kind of reaction or experience in her audience. She believes that creating the artwork in this way will achieve that. So it's this kind of plan or desire or goal. That's what the artist's intent is. Right. So let's, let's go through some of these views. <laughs> uh, now, strong intentionalism is not uh, a very popular view. There are very, very few philosophers who still defend this. Uh, again, the strong intentionalist will say that the meaning of an, of an artwork is just fixed by the artist's intention. And that's it. There is just nothing more to say about it. Um, the basic problem with strong intentionalism is that it leads to what's known as Humpty Dumptyism, because uh, in Through the Looking Glass, Humpty Dumpty famously declared that a word means whatever he chooses it to mean. Um, but of course, the argument goes, well, you can't, you can't just choose what a word means. Um, we distinguish the meaning of a sentence from what the speaker intends to convey. Uh, so as Sherry Irvin says in her article, Authors, Intentions and Literary Meaning, if I say that broccoli is white, 
I've said something false. And what I have said remains false, even if I insist that, you know, what I was thinking of in my head was uh, cauliflower, right? Um, like, by broccoli, I mean cauliflower. Well, broccoli doesn't mean cauliflower. The word broccoli doesn't refer to the white vegetable cauliflower, regardless of what was going on in my head, right? I've just, I made a mistake. I misused the word. Um, so in the, in the same way, um, the thought is, you know, an artist can't just choose what an artwork means. Um, if strong intentionalism were right, then any artwork could mean anything simply on the basis of the artist saying it so, but, but that doesn't seem right. Um, I mean, more generally, the, I suppose there's a worry that strong intentionalism doesn't leave enough room for artistic failure. Um, so surely I can intend to create an artwork that means that P, but then I might fail to do this. Uh, um, you know, meaning isn't trivial, it's an artistic achievement. The artwork has to be structured in the right kind of way in order to get its message across. Um, if, you know, if all it takes for an artwork to mean that P is for the artist to intend it to mean that P, then there's just no longer any kind of achievement at all uh, in, you know, in making an artwork that means that P. Um, so, you know, this, uh, it, it's, it's going to sort of un undermine the idea that the meaning or having some sort of message is one of the achievements of art. Um, and of course, if we're a strong, if we go for strong intentionalism, then we end up in a rather strange position where like the interpretation of an artwork is going to have basically nothing to do with what we see in the artwork itself. It's just going to be a matter of figuring out the intentions of the person who made the artwork. Um, but that, that, that seems to, you know, separate the meaning of the artwork a bit too far from the artwork itself. So strong intentionalism, you know, for, for these sorts of reasons, uh, has no longer, is no longer so popular. Um, what about the other extreme, anti-intentionalism? Well, this is taken a bit more seriously. Now, I mean, the first thing to bear in mind, uh, as far as anti-intentionalism is concerned, is that there's a difference between giving a causal explanation and giving an artistic interpretation. So when we ask of the skull in Ambassadors, why is it there? Uh, we might be asking for a causal explanation, or we might be asking for its meaning. Um, now, you know, Holbein's notebooks are obviously relevant to the causal question. Uh, if we want to know like what led him to put it in there, then yes, uh, his intentions matter. Um, but whether this fixes the meaning of the skull in the artwork is, uh, is another matter. So for the anti-intentionalist, interpreting an artwork does not involve giving a causal explanation of how the artwork came into being. When I ask, what is the meaning of this thing? I'm, I'm not, at least as far as the anti-intentionalist is concerned, I'm not, I'm not asking for some sort of causal model of how that thing was created. Um, so, okay, the classic statement of anti-intentionalism is uh, William Wimsatt and Monroe Beardsley's The Intentional Fallacy. Uh, they raise a few different arguments, uh, but uh, one, of the, one of their central arguments is a kind of dilemma for intentionalism. Let's say that an artist intends to imbue some meaning P into their artwork. Well, either the artist is successful in communi communicating their intention via the artwork, or she's not. Um, so let's suppose that she is successful in communicating her intention. Well, in that case, the artwork itself already displays the meaning. So there's no need to look beyond the artwork for information about its meaning. There's no, there's no need to look to her biography, to look to her, you know, private diaries or her statements about her intentions for the meaning of the artwork, because the meaning is already there in the artwork. She successfully, you know, she, she has created the artwork in such a way that it is successful at communicating that P. So it's there, it's there in the artwork. So the, the, you know, these biographical claims about her intentions are just redundant. They're not going to tell us more about the meaning of the work than what we see in the work itself. That's if she's successful at, with respect to this intention. On the other hand, suppose that she's not successful in communicating her intention. 
Well, in that case, the meaning that she intends is separate from the artwork itself. She has intended to communicate that P, but she's failed. And given that she's failed, this is just to say that the artwork does not mean that P. If we were to attribute her intention to the artwork itself, we would be reading into the artwork something that, by hypothesis, is not there. Uh, we're not really interpreting the artwork at this point, we're interpreting the artist. Our, like, our question is, what is the meaning of this artwork? And since the artist, by hypothesis, has failed to communicate that P, P cannot be the meaning of the artwork. So, <clears throat> if this argument is right, then um, whether the artist succeeds or fails at communicating her intention, information about her intention uh, is, is irrelevant. I mean, it's, it's either redundant or irrelevant. Uh, either the meaning is just available in the artwork itself or, um, you know, or, or it's not, but if it's not, then we would be reading into the artwork something that isn't there if we interpret it in light of her intentions. So this is one general uh, concern about uh, intentionalism, uh, which maybe should push us in the, the anti-intentionalist direction. Another common argument against intentionalism, which is also raised by uh, Winsett and Beardsley, is a kind of epistemic challenge. So very often, uh, the intentions of an artist will simply be unknown to us. As it happens, this is the case for Holbein's ambassadors. We don't actually know what motivated Holbein to include the skull. And at this point, I, I assume it's unlikely that we're going to discover anything that could tell us what his intentions actually were. Um, you know, we so, okay, we have various plausible hypotheses, right? I mean, you know, maybe it was just thrown in there as like a you know, memento mori. Maybe it was more than that. Maybe it's, uh, you know, there are ways of interpreting the skull in light of the picture, the painting as a whole. Um, but, you know, we don't really know, right? Um, so the, this kind of problem is going to become especially pressing when we consider anonymous art, uh, where we don't even know who the artist is. Um, so intentionalism is going to make the meaning of art hidden. It's going to render us unable to interpret it. Like once we Okay, so the skull in Ambassadors, um, we don't know what Holbein's intentions were. But given that we don't know what his intentions were, we just have to say, well, you know, from at least as far as the intentionalist is concerned, we're going to have to say, well, we just don't know what the meaning is. Um, and, like, that's that. You know, the discussion ends there. Um, there's perhaps a, a deeper challenge here as well, which is, Sometimes there may be no fact of the matter what the artist's intentions are. Uh, this problem is going to arise specifically with respect to artworks that are created by multiple people. So with many films, for instance, there are going to be a variety of creative voices that each have a great deal of input into the final product. Uh, take the film Blade Runner. One of the central interpre interpretive questions about Blade Runner is whether or not the main character, Rick Deckard, is a replicant. So, the director Ridley Scott has said that, in his view, Deckard is indeed a replicant. Um, producer Michael Dealey and actor Harrison Ford have both said that, in their view, Deckard is not a replicant. And one of the script writers, Hampton Fanshire, has said that he wanted it to be ambiguous whether Deckard is a replicant. So, we've got the whole, the whole range of views here uh, from people who had a central role in the creation of this film. Um, so, whose intentions count? Right, we've got a whole bunch of um, yeah, a whole bunch of different artists involved in the creation of this movie, um, and it's you know they say different things. So um, you know yeah, who who do we who do we go with? Whose intentions determine whether or not Rick Deckard is actually a replicant? If you go for so I, I think you know the, the challenge for the for the intentionalist would be to you know specify like okay, in the case of artworks with multiple artists. How do we determine whose intentions actually matter? Like, I mean, do we have to say, like, does everybody's intentions count? And we have to maybe weight them in different ways? Maybe maybe Ridley Scott, as the director, his intentions get weighted a bit more heavily than the producers. I Like, I don't know. Like, how do we do that? Um, so that's one, that's one uh, other sort of concern here. So, okay, there are a couple of um, responses that an intentionalist might have to... Um, to this uh, epistemic challenge. 
so first of all, intentionalists might well just deny that there's really that much of a challenge here. Um, people's intentions aren't usually hidden to us. Uh, for one thing, the artwork itself often provides very strong evidence of intention. Uh, even if we knew nothing about the person who created the film Triumph of the Will, we would still be able to make a reasonable inference that they intended to produce Nazi propaganda. That's just the irresistible reading of that work, given its properties and the time it was created. Uh, further evidence of intention can be gleaned from other works produced by the artist, from you know statements made by the artist, uh, from uh, the social context in which the artist was working, and so on. So. You know, there is, of course, a general problem of other minds. Um, you know, it's it's not entirely obvious, right, how we justify our beliefs about uh, the mental states of other people. But putting aside, so, so like, as long as we get on board with the idea that we can, in fact, hold justified beliefs about the mental states of other people, the intentionalist will say there's no special problem with working out the intentions of artists. Um, indeed, if anything, artists are, are often quite vocal about their intentions. Um, as for cases like Blade Runner, where you have multiple artists with conflicting intentions, well, yes, this can happen, but again, it's kind of rare, right? Like, especially, I mean, you know, okay, it, okay, it is gonna happen, but, you know, the sort of situation where you have a case like Blade Runner, where there's, you know, a really important question about the film, about the nature of the main character in the film, and you have, different creative voices with very different opinions about what's going on there. Um, that's not usually what happens. Uh, usually, you know, there's there's agreement, at least among the uh, the most, you know, the main people involved. Um, so, you know, this, this problem, it is a problem, right? Sometimes intentions will be hidden, sometimes intentions will be determinate, but will be uh, vague and indeterminate, but... Um, it's it's rare, right? Uh, it's not like this is just going to render us unable to interpret all of the art we engage with. So with that said, then, you know, let's say we grant that that like sometimes uh, the meaning of an artwork really is just unknown um, or, un, or, or or ambiguous. Well, that doesn't seem like a particularly counterintuitive result. OK, so sometimes the meaning of an artwork is unknown to us. Yeah, I mean, we have various reasonable hypotheses about Holbein's skull. We're not sure which is true. Uh, it's not exactly the most devastating sceptical conclusion. Uh, similarly, in the case of a film like Blade Runner, well, maybe it's just unclear whether Deckard is a replicant. You know, the relevant artists don't agree. Uh, the film can support multiple interpretations. Yeah, again, is that uh, is that a devastating sceptical conclusion? So I think uh, intentionalists could argue that you know, this epistemic challenge is maybe not much of a challenge at all. Um, you know, and, and remember that for moderate intentionalists, the intentions of the artist will only determine which meaning is right out of many possible meanings. So um, you don't need to appeal to intention to offer plausible interpretations of an artwork. It's just which of those interpretations counts as actually being right will be fixed by the artist's intention. Um, you know, so it's it's not as though we, we can't say anything, right? For a strong intentionalist, maybe this would be a bit more of an issue, but moderate intentionalists, again, they will appeal to uh, other factors than the artist's intention in order to give interpretations of art. Okay, so... Um, another point the anti-intentionalist might raise is um, the relation between uh, meaning and other features of artworks, other, yeah, other artistic properties. So suppose, suppose we ask, what are the descriptive properties of a given artwork? For instance, if we're talking about a film, what actually takes place in the film? Like what is shown on the screen? I mean, we could even reduce this to like, what is the, you know, what is the pattern of colours and sounds that are that are displayed? Um, now, if this is the question, then it seems that the artist's intentions are going to be completely irrelevant. The fact that an artist intended the film to have some descriptive property P 
does not provide any support whatsoever for the claim that it does in fact have that property. We have to look at the film itself. Um, you know, like, we have to, yeah, so d does the film display a character running at, you know, 10 minutes, 30 seconds, right? Well, it doesn't matter what the artist's intentions were. It, the film, you just look at the film itself to figure that one out. Similarly, if you ask, like, what is the value of the artwork? Presumably the artist intends the artwork to be good, but that doesn't make it good. Um, you know, they want their work to be good, yeah, they intend that, but the fact that they intend it to be good, uh, again, that, that just doesn't do anything to make it good. Um, and actually this goes the other way as well. You know, some people suggest that uh, Bob Dylan's self-portrait or Lou Reed's metal machine music were intended to be jokes or they were intending to just, you know, give the finger to record companies. They weren't even trying to make good music. Um, well, no matter, I would say that they did, in fact, make excellent music. I love both of those albums. I think they are, I, th I think they're masterpieces, quite frankly. And it doesn't matter what Bob Dylan and Lou Reed were trying to do when they made those albums. Even if Bob Dylan and Lou Reed were trying to make terrible albums, I would just say, well, you know, they failed. Um, they, they accidentally stumbled into making something wonderful. So, um, you know, these sorts of points are, you know, they're not so controversial as anti-intentionalism with respect to meaning. I mean, I think probably most people would be anti-intentionalists about descriptive properties, um, certainly. Um, but, but then again, you know, if we say that intention is irrelevant in these cases, then what makes meaning different, right? Like, how can meaning transcend the artwork itself in this kind of way, uh, whereas these other features don't? Um, so, you know, I mean, as, as Wimser and Beardsley say, uh, what a pudding consists of and what it tastes like is independent of the chef's intentions. Uh, how the parts of a washing machine work and what they do is independent of the intentions of the creators. Why not the same for an artwork, right? <laughs> you know, an artwork is just another kind of artifact. Um, it's independent of the artist. It's not as though the artist is somehow still there inhabiting the artwork itself. Um, you know, when I, when I watch a movie, it's not like the artist's mouth is literally there speaking through the screen. Uh, the artwork is an autonomous object. Um, and, you know, if I, if I want to sort of describe the properties uh, that the artwork has, then for, in the vast majority of cases, it's going to be completely irrelevant what the, uh, what the, the artist intends. Um, but for some reason, when it comes to the meaning, we're saying that, you know, the intentionalist is saying, ah, well, now... Um, now you have to be concerned about the artist's intent. So why? What makes it special? So this is, yeah, this is one way to maybe uh, push for anti-intentionalism. I mean, on the other hand, the, the intentionalist might respond, well, you know, look, artistic intention is part of the causal history of the artwork. And the causal history of artworks is relevant in various respects, important respects. So this can be relevant to the aesthetic value of the work. So consider two seemingly identical sketches on the back of a napkin. One of these sketches was created by, you know, a random street artist. The other was created by Picasso while Picasso was experimenting with uh, certain new ideas, right? It's sort of in the early years of uh, Picasso's development as an artist. Mm, most people are probably going to say that the... Uh, the second sketch is more valuable, um, you know, partly for what it tells us about Picasso's development, right? Because we're sort of, we can take that sketch and, you know, place it in the context of Picasso's work in general. And it might, it might sort of give us interesting information about him. And of course, partly just because it's a Picasso. Um, but in any case, uh, you know, we would probably assign like greater value to that. You'd certainly get more money for it. Um, okay, so uh, a final argument uh, for anti-intentionalism is Daniel Nathan's publicity paradox. Okay, so when creating an artwork, the artist will have various uh, first-order intentions about what the artwork is supposed to mean. Perhaps the artwork, you know, the, uh, the artist intends the artwork to represent the exploitation of workers under capitalism. So, you know, she creates the artwork with this in mind and, and tries to encode this into the artwork. 
But at the same time, as an artwork, she's producing this for public consumption. So, according to Nathan, she will have a secondary intention, a, a higher order intention, that anything relevant to the artwork's meaning will be present in the artwork itself. So this is to say, artists intend their works to stand on their own feet, as it were. Uh, a, a careful interpreter should be able to figure out what the artwork represents. A careful interpreter, in this case, should be able to figure out that the artwork represents the exploitation of workers under capitalism on the basis of the artwork and their knowledge of, you know, art history and broader culture. It shouldn't require combing through information about the private life of the artist or anything like that. Um, and again, this is going to be what the artist herself will intend while creating the artwork. So, so the artist intends that properly appreciating her artwork will not require understanding her intentions. Uh, now, in many cases, this secondary intention may not be explicit. So Nathan says that this is, and I quote, a necessary presupposition of the artistic endeavour, but it may not be explicitly acknowledged by artists. So, I mean, that's a, yeah, okay, so hmm, is it really an intention? Um, but, you know, the uh, the idea is, no, this, this, is, this is an intention insofar as the artist intends to create this work for public consumption, right? She's intending to create uh, an, an, a particular kind of object, right? An object for public consumption, which is, you know, taken as a, a sort of singular thing, right? Like we, when we, when we engage with artworks, we look at an artwork as a singular whole, you know, I, like a painting can be interpreted just on its own terms as a painting. Um, a film can be just watched as a film and, you know, you think about it and try to interpret it in light of what's shown in the artwork against your kind of background knowledge of, yeah, artistic convention, social convention, and so on. That's just how art works, right? Um, so, so yeah, the um, artists will, will have, maybe not explicitly acknowledged, but at least implicitly, they have a secondary intention, a higher order intention, that uh, appreciation of the artwork does not require understanding their intentions. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the artwork itself is supposed to carry the, the representational burden, um, and therefore intentionalism is just incoherent, right? Intentionalism requires us to consider the artist's intentions, but one of those intentions, one of those very important intentions, is that the intentions not be considered. Okay then, just a quick advert. If you like my channel and you want to support me, I have a Patreon. Uh, I upload bonus videos on there, so you know, you 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 get to th throw me some money and support my channel and you get something in return. Um, uh, if you just want to send a one-off donation, I do have a PayPal. I also offer private tutoring in philosophy and I have a Discord. The links to all of that will be in the description. Okay, let's turn to arguments in favour of intentionalism. We've had a look at anti-intentionalism. Let's see what the intentionalist has to say. Um, now, as I said, most philosophers who defend intentionalism only defend moderate intentionalism. So that's what we'll focus on. All right, then. Well, I suppose, you know, one initial point we could make in favour of intentionalism is, uh, the, is, is a kind of underdetermination argument. So we've seen that, uh, you know, a standard way of formulating moderate intentionalism is that the artist's intention tells us which is the actual meaning of the artwork among various possible meanings. But, you know, this suggests an argument for the view, right? So the content of the artwork plus the broader social context is almost always insufficient to determine a particular meaning for the work. There are going to be multiple admissible interpretations given that evidence. So what is the actual meaning? Well, that's determined by the artist's intentions. Um, again, consider Holbein's ambassadors. We're, we're asking, what is the point of the skull? Well, we have a number of different hypotheses on the table about this. But now suppose we were to discover a set of notebooks in which Holbein describes in detail exactly why he put the skull there, 
what he takes it to mean, what he wants to express with it. And, you know, suppose that all of this is in line with everything else that we see in the painting, plus with the artistic conventions. Um, so, you know, Holbein doesn't say anything totally incongruous, right? He's not saying that the skull was intended to represent strawberry pickers or anything like that. Um, it's, you know, in line with what we expect. Well then, doesn't that answer our question? Like, doesn't that really seem like it tells us the meaning of the skull? Like, by learning Holbein's intentions, we've learned something about the meaning of the skull. That seems pretty intuitive, right? Um, now, for, a, for, a, for the moderate intentionalist, of course, an artist isn't going to have total control over what their artwork means. If Holbein had said that the skull represented strawberry pickers, we would simply discount that. Um, you know, so it, it, there's various plausible interpretations. Holbein's intention determines which of these interpretations is right. So we have, a, you know, the given the uh, the properties of the artwork plus our understanding of artistic conventions, we have an underdetermination problem. We have, you know, multiple interpretations that could fit this, um, and we appeal to Holbein's intentions in order to uh, resolve that problem. Um, but there are a couple of responses to this on behalf of the anti-intentionalist. I mean, the first question would just be, well, is underdetermination of meaning actually a problem? I mean, suppose we end up saying that there's no fact of the matter exactly what Holbein's skull represents, um, or that there's no fact of the matter whether Deckard is a replicant. There's just multiple interpretations of these, many of which are equally adequate. Well, that doesn't seem like much of a problem. Indeed, isn't that what we expect of artworks? You know, artworks permit multiple adequate interpretations. In any case, as we've seen, this is a problem that the intentionalist faces as well. Sometimes we will be unable to determine the artist's intentions. Sometimes artworks have multiple artists with conflicting intentions. So I guess, you know, the message here would be whether we are intentionalists or anti-intentionalists, we're just sometimes going to find ourselves unable to, uh, you know, with, with, artworks will just sometimes not have determinate meanings and that's that. Um, in any case, the anti-intentionalist might also say, well, look, there are ways of resolving underdetermination without appealing to the artist's intentions. So one suggestion comes from what's known as the value maximizing account, which says that we should choose whichever interpretation maximizes the artistic value of the artwork. Is Rick Deckard in Blade Runner a replicant? Well, we just have to ask, which, make, which interpretation makes for the better film. If the themes of Blade Runner would be better elaborated under the assumption that Deckard is a replicant, then that is the right interpretation. So this sort of thing would allow us to decide between competing interpretations without deferring to the intentions of the artist. Um, okay then, so, you know, that's one motivation for moderate intentionalism is underdetermination, but maybe there are plausible responses to that. Another motivation for moderate intentionalism is that only intentionalism can deal with irony. Only intentionalism can make sense of irony. Some artworks are intended to be ironic, um, like Swift's Modest Proposal. Uh, that's a famous case of irony. But in some cases, the irony is not so obvious. Um, uh, a famous case of this is Daniel Defoe's The Shortest Way with the Dissenters, which ostensibly at attacks the dissenters. Now, most modern scholars take it to be satirical. At the time of release, many people interpreted it as genuine. Um, moreover, even those who take it to be satirical agree that Defoe's irony was too subtle. Um, to this extent, his work was a failure. Uh, so, The Shortest Way is ironic, but to understand that it's ironic, we need to understand Defoe's intentions. It's not obvious from the work itself. For a similar example, uh, maybe the work of the Marquis de Sade. Many people interpret this work as ironic or satirical. Uh, Sade was not, in fact, genuinely arguing for brutality and bloodshed. Maybe he was doing something else. Uh, you know, he was it, it, satirising 
the clergy, the aristocracy, other authority figures, perhaps. Um, but in any case, even if you think that that is the right interpretation of what Desaad was doing, it's far from obvious from the writing itself. Um, to understand Desaad's irony, we need to look at his intentions. Um, we need to look at his biographical details. So, if a work of, of art is ironic, its meaning is different from what it explicitly appears to be. But then what determines this ironic meaning? Well, in some cases, where the irony is too subtle to be discerned from the work itself, it must be the intentions of the author. And so, the, uh, the moderate intentionalist will say that they're better placed to deal with cases like, you know, Daniel Defoe and the Marquis de Sade. So I think that the, the anti-intentionalist has a, a pretty plausible response to this type of argument, which is just, well, if the irony can't be detected in the work itself, you know, work itself plus our understanding of the broader cultural context and so on, then the work just isn't ironic after all. So, yes... Defoe attempted to satirise the Tories who, who were attacking the dissenters, but he failed. Um, and he actually, what he actually did was write a straightforward anti-dissenter pamphlet. I mean, isn't that exactly what makes it failed irony? Um, you know, uh, yeah, he, he, he tried to write something that was, uh, that was ironic and then he just failed to do so. Uh, so, you know, the anti-intentionalist remember, does not deny that understanding art requires placing art in a broader context. When we read Defoe's Shortest Way, we need an understanding of language in general, we need to understand the different political positions of the Tories and the dissenters, we need to know something about the social context of the time. But this larger context should be sufficient to determine whether the piece is serious or ironic. If the irony isn't clear, even when all of this context is taken into account, then the author has just failed to create an ironic work. Like, that's the difference. The difference between, you know, Swift's modest proposal and Defoe's shortest way is that Swift's modest proposal actually is ironic. And it's ironic precisely because you can just see that without bothering, you know, you don't need to consult Swift's intentions to figure out that it was supposed to be ironic. Okay, so one of the most uh, influential recent arguments for intentionalism is the conversation argument, which was proposed by Noel Carroll. Um, Carroll argues that engaging with art is analogous to a conversation. Um, artists aim to communicate with their audience, and the audience for an artwork understands that art is a kind of communication. So as Carol puts it, when we engage with art, and I quote, the interaction is a matter of a conversation between the artist and us, a human encounter in which we have a desire to know what the artist intends, not only, not only out of respect for the artist, but also because we have a personal interest in being a capable respondent. Art then, uh, on this view, is a, a kind of conversational exchange. But if engaging with artworks is analogous to conversation, then the mental states of the artist become very significant. When I have a conversation with another person, I'm attempting to interpret not just her utterances. I'm attempting to interpret her. I'm attempting to understand the way that she sees things and what she's thinking. And then I, you know, and then I can respond accordingly. You know, imagine if, that you were to have a conversation with somebody, but you were to focus only on trying to interpret their words in the most interesting or aesthetically valuable way you know you were just you were just focusing on the words themselves as kind of objects like separate from the person autonomous objects floating there separately from the person saying them maybe there would be some sort of intellectual satisfaction from doing this but you would fail to realize one of the basic goods of a conversation you would fail to have communicated with another person. So the same is the case for art. 
the artist is trying to communicate something to us with her art, so we should respect that. We should make an attempt to understand what it is that the artist is trying to say, and that means that our interpretation of the art must be guided by the artist's intentions. If we fail to do this, if you know, if we, if we disregard her intentions, then we, we disrespect the artist herself by refusing to engage with her as a partner. And we also deprive ourselves of the, you know, the good of a human connection. That's the basic idea of the conversation argument. So is that convincing? Well, a standard objection to this is that the analogy between art and conversation is misleading. So, in particular, when we engage with art, there's a crucial feature of conversation that is missing. Art is not reciprocal. I can't in any significant way interact with the artist. Rather, I just observe the work that she has already produced. That's not analogous to a conversation. It's more analogous to a monologue. The artist talks to me while I listen. Um, but conversation is mutual, it's reciprocal, it's an exchange of ideas. So Huddleston in the article, The Conversation Argument for Actual Intentionalism, uh, suggests that there's an openness condition on conversation. Participants in a genuine conversation must be open to the ideas of their interlocutors, but an artist can't be open to the ideas of her audience in the relevant sense. Um, you know, the artwork has already been made, right? She she creates the artwork, she puts it out into the world, and then that's that. I mean, you know, she can be open to the ideas of her audience in the sense that she might listen to their reactions to that work or whatever, but the point is, is that that's not going to then affect that work itself. That, that artwork, you know, if it's a painting or whatever, the painting's made, it's done, and, you know, now the, the audience can respond, um, but there's no... It, there's not actually an interaction via the artwork. And notice that on the audience side, an interpretation of a work of art is not going to be offered primarily to the artist. It's rather offered to the community, like, or maybe just to yourself or to your friends, but not usually, but not to the artist, right? So if I propose an interpretation of the ending of 2001 A Space Odyssey, I'm not talking to Stanley Kubrick. I'm not trying to talk to Stanley Kubrick. I'm talking to other potential viewers of the film. Some of those viewers I might well have a genuine conversation with. Um, but I'm not, I'm not entering into any sort of conversation with Kubrick. Um, and, you know, if we recall Nathan's paradox of publicity, the aim of the artist is, is surely, you know, like, do we want to say, well, the aim of the artist is, is to get another person to talk to them? Presumably not, right? Like, they would more often want the artwork to be appreciated for its own sake, or maybe they just want to direct the attention of their audience to broader issues, you know, in, the, like, if the art is made in order to serve the purpose of political propaganda, um, well, conversation isn't really the point there, right? Um, Huddleston notes uh, attention in Carroll's conversation argument. On the one hand, a conversation, uh, as we've said, involves an openness to the idea of others. But now consider our interpretation uh, as the intentionalist sees it. Uh, the art interpretation is constrained by the intent of the artist. The artist has the final say. So if I interpret an artwork as meaning that P, but the artist insists that she did not mean this, then the art doesn't mean that P, and that's that. So this means that the audience's interpretive opinions are not worth taking seriously. Um, it, like, if the, if the audience interprets the artwork in a way that significantly diverges from what the artist intends, then the audience is simply wrong, and yeah, and that's that. Their interpretation can be dismissed. The audience is required not to think independently, not to come up with their own ideas. But, Huddleston says, this clearly violates one of the norms of conversation. So he says, to quote, Our role as interpreters, and as supposed conversational participants, is apparently to sit down, shut up, and listen to the author's monologue. Our ideas do not matter. You know, if I'm in a conversation, there's a presupposition that I might have something to add, I might have some sort of insight to give, but intentionalism seems to rule this out, at least in some important respects. So on Huddleston's view, it is important to consider the intentions of the artist, but 
the artist doesn't have the final say. Uh, if we can come up with an interpretation of the work that we find valuable, we may endorse this even if it is contrary to the artist's intentions. We are free to invent our own interpretations. Um, and actually, that not that just how we should act if interpretation is analogous to conversation? Like, if art is analogous to conversation, isn't that what you would expect? Okay, the artist, maybe she has one idea in mind about what it means, but I have a different idea about what it means. Uh, so we might think that the uh, conversation analogy can be flipped to support anti-intentionalism. Okay then, we have uh, examined the debate between intentionalists and anti-intentionalists. Uh, before ending, I'll introduce another view that has become popular recently, uh, which is hypothetical intentionalism. Hypothetical intentionalism is a middle path between the intentionalist and anti-intentionalist positions. Uh, so according to hypothetical intentionalism, the meaning of an artwork is determined by the best hypothesis about what the artist's intentions would be given the available evidence. Uh, so the audience of an, of an artwork can make inferences about the artist's intentions from the work itself. So when we watch Blade Runner, we notice several indications that Deckard is a replicant. Maybe we also think that if Deckard were a replicant, this would elaborate on the themes of the film in an interesting way. So then we, we make this proposal. We say, huh, seems like the creator of the film intended to suggest that Deckard is a replicant. Now, for the hypothetical intentionalist, it's at this point, irrelevant what the creators of the work themselves would say about this. It's irrelevant what they intended, what they actually intended. Even if everybody involved in making Blade Runner were to deny that Deckard was intended to be a replicant, the best this is the best hypothesis about the creator's intentions. So, on hypothetical intentionalism, this is the correct interpretation of the film. So basically, the, the meaning of an artwork is not determined by the intentions of any actual person. Instead, when engaging with an artwork, we imagine an idealised artist who is given intentions that provide the best possible fit to the features of the artwork. The idealised artist is also fully aware of the relevant artistic conventions and background social factors. Um, and, you know, in giving an interpretation, we try to minimise the amount of the artwork that must be taken as merely a matter of accident. So... Basically, we make a hypothesis about what this idealised, fully informed artist would have intended were they the creators of the artwork in, ten in, in question. So, like, what would this fully informed artist have intended if she had created an artwork just like this? And, you know, it's, it's the intentions, it's this, these hypothetical intentions that determine the meaning of the artwork. So there are some concerns with this sort of view. I mean, one question, of course, is what information do we use in order to form our, our hypotheses about the hypothetical artist's intentions? If we use only the artwork plus background artistic conventions, then the worry would be that hypothetical intentionalism just collapses into bog standard anti-intentionalism. So you know, the hypothesis, so the hypothesis about the idealised artist's intentions will be guided only by the artwork itself, plus background artistic conventions. But that is exactly the data that the anti-intentionalist uses when she is interpreting the artwork. So our hypothesis about the artist's intentions also presupposes an ideal artist. So we minimise the amount of the artwork that must be treated as accidental. You know, we try to give meaning to as much of it as we can. But again, this is just the same thing that the anti-intentionalist does. The anti-intentionalist takes all features of the artwork as material for interpretation. Um, so it ends up seeming like uh, there's not going to be much difference between the hypothetical intentionalist and the anti-intentionalist if this is the information that's used. On the other hand, if we include literally all available information, including private diaries and correspondence from the artist, well then the worry would be that hypothetical intentionalism collapses to moderate intentionalism. So, you know, 
Ridley Scott says that in his view, Deckard is a replicant, that he made the film with this in mind. Well, this very strongly supports the hypothesis that the director of Blade Runner intended Deckard to be a replicant. Um, you know, even if we think that Blade Runner is a stronger film under the interpretation <clears throat> that Deckard is a human or whatever, it would be rather tortured to defend that hypothesis given that the director of the film intended otherwise. Um, you know, so if we, yeah, if, if, we're, if we're looking at all of the available information and we're forming, you know, like we're asking which hypothesis provides the best fit for all the available information. Well, at that point, it looks like we're just going to be giving a hypothesis about what actually happened, right? We just be giving a hypothesis about, I mean, that's, that's how we form hypotheses about what actually happened, right? We consider all of the information. Um, so we end up with what looks like uh, standard intentionalism. So as a result of this, hypothetical intentionalists tend to draw a distinction between public and private evidence about the artwork. Um, we can consider public evidence about the artist's intentions where public evidence essentially amounts to information that the artist wanted the audience to know. So private diaries and letters to friends are out, um, maybe information that the artist revealed many years later are out, but things like information cards next to a painting in a museum, that's fine. I mean, obviously drawing a clear distinction between public and private evidence is uh, it's not, a, not an easy matter. Um, so this is going to be one challenge for the hypothetical intentionalist. Uh, another worry about hypothetical intentionalism is just, well, what is supposed to be the significance of these hypothetical intentions? Like, wh why should we care about about this? Um, so as Sherry Irvin points out, um, you know, we often propose hypotheses, we usually propose hypotheses in order to figure out what the facts are. The hypothetical intentionalist isn't even trying to figure out the facts. At least she's not trying to figure out the facts about the artist's intentions. Um, so why is meaning fixed by merely a hypothetical intention rather than an actual intention? I mean, you might think that if intention matters at all, surely it should be the actually existing intention that matters. After all, actual intentions do at least play a causal role in the creation of an artwork. Um, you know, there's, there's something odd about interpreting art according to our best hypothesis about the artist's intentions, but then completely discounting direct evidence about the artist's intentions, such as what the artist herself has to say. Um, so, yeah, that was, uh, that was art and interpretation and some different views of artistic interpretation. And that's the end of that video. So, hope you found that interesting. I'll see you next time. Goodbye, everybody.